first of all, thank you, everybody who's watching. We've had a lot of things that have happened this week. Uh, we have a task force that's formed, and we're going to talk about that today. And we've made some great progress within the communities, uh, both sides of the river, so I'm very pleased about that. We have another week in which city offices have been open, and it's gone uneventful. People are coming back into the facility, and we're getting business done. Our first speaker today will be Desi Fleming, Director of Cass County Public Health. Desi? Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. So current data as of yesterday lists 1,571 positive cases in North Dakota with 866 of those in Cass County, accounting for 55% of the state's positive cases. There have been 29 deaths to date and recovered cases stand at 480. Close contacts and community spread still account for 72% of the exposure source for COVID infections within our county, which again underscores the importance of being aware of your surroundings and those around you and by practicing physical distancing and wearing a face mask in public where distancing is challenging. On April 12th, only one month ago today, we had a total of 95 cases in Cass County. As of yesterday, we have increased by 771 positive cases. This illustrates how highly infectious this virus is, how rapidly COVID-19 has spread in our community. In response to this, Governor Bergen requested the creation of the Red River Valley COVID-19 Task Force. The overarching goal of this task force is to prevent and mitigate community spread of COVID-19 in Cass County through a metro-wide strategy approach. The identified metric for the task force is to decrease the county positivity rate to be equal or less than the state average, which is around 3%. Currently, we are at 8.4%. A strategy identified by the task force is targeted testing. This involves focusing testing efforts on individuals that may have a higher risk of exposure due to a variety of factors, such as employment or occupation, living situations, or exposure to a known positive COVID case. By identifying risk based on these factors, along with epidemiology data, we can focus the testing to help identify more positive cases and provide education on the isolation and quarantine procedures, which eventually works to decrease the spread. From a public health perspective, individual privacy and confidentiality is a priority, so specific testing groups will not be announced or made public. It's important to understand that those individuals participating in the testing are receiving a healthcare service and their privacy should be respected. To achieve this, the task force will not release specific results these, to these closed testing events. And as a reminder, all Cass County testing data is available and updated daily on the North Dakota Department of Health website. As targeted testing increases in our area, we expect to identify more positive cases. As positive cases increase, so does our need for contact tracing. Another strategy for a Red River Valley Task Force is to assess local contact tracing needs and partner with the state to provide resources to expand our existing capabilities. The task force will also assess these activities from a metro perspective, so coordination between North Dakota and Clay County, Minnesota will take place at the state level involving the Minnesota Department of Health and the North Dakota Department of Health. Fargo Cass Public Health functions under the North Dakota Department of Health to provide contact tracing for Cass County. Our current operation is fairly robust with over 30 staff working 12 hours every day, seven days a week. We have some internal capacity left, but as Cass County numbers increase, we will require assistance from the state to assist with the addition of staff and resources. As you know, contact tracing is an important piece of the puzzle in identifying contacts and a crucial step to help slow the spread of the virus. I always like to close with some thoughts. So I recently heard a comparison of how the amount of coronavirus information available is similar to getting a drink of water from a fire hose. There's more information than we can actually process. That being said, we have to be really cautious on what sources we use. So consider the source of the information, find supporting sources to that information, and read beyond. Try use known credible sources for information such as the North Dakota Department of Health, the CDC, and the World Health Organization websites. Another perspective I was reminded of again is that this pandemic is a marathon and not a sprint. It may feel as though this has lasted a year, but in reality has barely been eight weeks. We all would like things to go back to our normal, but this is not going away anytime soon. 
What we need to do is figure out how to find that balance, knowing that COVID will be in our community for quite some time. We need to adjust to our new realities as well as the many uncertainties. One thing that is on many people's mind this time of year is the upcoming graduations. For those of you that don't know, I have a son who will be graduating from high school this year, who I am incredibly proud of. Nothing would make me happier to be able to plan a normal graduation party for him with our family and friends. But unfortunately, we will not be able to celebrate in traditional ways given this current pandemic and that the 2020 graduation will look very different from the 2019 graduation. That doesn't minimize their accomplishments or mean that we shouldn't acknowledge them in other creative ways. We need to think of each other as we consider plans and what risks we may be exposing everyone to, especially grandparents and those with underlying health conditions. If you are choosing to celebrate, please be sure that those prevention practices Physical distancing along with smaller group sizes and being outdoors are factored in every step of your plan. As the director of Fargo Cass Public Health, as a member of our community, as a parent of a Davies graduate, I would like to publicly recognize all of the 2020 graduates in our community. Congratulations and well done. I wish you all a bright and happy future. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. I know a lot of graduates are upset that they don't get the, tra the traditional uh, celebrations, but we're seeing a lot of signs up, a lot of balloons, uh, a lot of proud parents out there. Uh, Clay County Public Health, uh, Kathy McKay now will speak to us about Clay County's efforts and what's going on on that side of the river. Thank you and good morning. Um, our Clay County numbers um, continue to rise as well. We have 254 cases, but we know that that number changes daily. And we always have those uh, that information um, on our website as well as the uh, Minnesota Department of Health website. We currently have 17 deaths. All of these deaths were individuals that were living in um, a long-term care facility. Uh, the Minnesota testing as of Tuesday, they, they have done 120,834 tests. They continue to increase their testing um, capabilities and in increasing the testing um, strategies along the way. The Department of Public Health, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health lab has done 15,229 of those tests. They also use other external labs um, that do the bulk of the rest of the, uh, the lab testing. Uh, as Desi and uh, Mayor Mahoney mentioned, we are part of the Red River Valley COVID Task Force group. We were invited um, by Mayor Mahoney and the governor's office to join this task force and work collaboratively in our metro area to focus on controlling the spread of the virus and working um, jointly across the river. So we are appreciative of being part of that group and anticipate this will be a great effort. We are also um, developed a subgroup as part of that Red River Valley COVID task force. And the subgroup is involving uh, a few more partners uh, Minnesota and Clay County Public Health. Um, we're working with the state health departments. Mayor Judd has been on that uh, group, uh, our Minnesota Director of Infectious Disease and, uh, and a physician as well. And this group is discussing our long-term testing strategies, long-term care trust testing strategies, and our follow-up, as well as resources for the potential staffing shortages. Um, MDH is working on a long-term care toolkit and they're finalizing their strategic plan and, and it's um, soon to be operationalized. We are also involved with the Minnesota Long-Term Care Work Group. So it's a number of counties across the state of Minnesota working collaboratively with the Minnesota Department of Health. And we are discussing each of our roles and how we're facing the uh, the COVID outbreaks um, in our long-term care facilities. Those are often um, due to medical compromise. They, off, they are closer contacts with people and they have pre-existing staffing challenges in that industry. We're coordinating with our regional healthcare coalitions for the immediate response and resources. We're, we will coordinate with our Minnesota Testing Command Center to ensure the testing supplies are moved efficiently where they are needed. We're expanding their testing. We're gonna ensure that the personal protective equipment and adequate staffing are available.
for especially those facilities facing the outbreaks. Um, we will make sure facilities maintain their strong preparedness plans to reduce transmission and to limit the exposure risks. We ask facilities' commitment to reduce transmission by, of course, excluding their ill workers, those who test positive, and excluding those with unprotected exposure. All of these efforts support the Minnesota five-point battle plan. So all of the strategies I, I described are in that plan to protect our most vulnerable populations, particularly those in our long-term care facilities. So we want to thank all of the healthcare workers and the staff in our congregate care settings for, the, for their dedication and their compassion for all of their residents. We realize this is especially challenging in dealing with this new virus that's impacting so many of their residents. We thank all of you for everything that you do each and every day for all of the residents that you work with. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Thank you, Kathy. Next speaker comes from Essentia Health, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Rich Better. Good morning, it's good to be with all of you again today. As we know, uh, COVID-19 is on the top of everyone's mind these days. And uh, we've been all instructed to stay home, practice social isolation, uh, and to, slow the, to help spread, slow the spread of the coronavirus infection. As we've discussed the last couple of weeks, while this is good advice, there are some situations where we need you to seek out care in person. I want all of you to know that at Essentia, we will continue our tradition of providing safe, personalized care for our patients and communities, and our goal is to keep you and our staff healthy. We do this by providing routine preventive care, health screenings, as well as managing chronic health conditions and acute care needs uh, when those are required. One of the silver linings, I think, of this pandemic uh, has been the acceleration of our vision to provide health care that is convenient of high quality uh, and helps make healthcare more affordable. One of the ways to do this is through the use of technology. Since we've la launched our, visual, our virtual visit uh, platform at the beginning of the pandemic, yesterday we hit a milestone of providing over 100,000 visits, patient visits by uh, virtual means. We're currently doing over 3,500 a day. We found that these interactions have been well received by our clinicians and patients. Satisfaction of our patients is high and is reported to be as good uh, or as better or better than our face-to-face -face visits and have been very useful in providing uh, the ability to provide safe care in the comfort of uh, patients' homes during this pandemic. But again, I want to remind all of you that there are some conditions that still do require a face-to-face -face visit whether that's for necessary diagnostic testing or other procedures. And we want you to know that we're here and we're gonna provide that care in a safe way. Some of the things that you'll notice when you enter our facilities, uh, again, are the um, screening of everyone at the door, universal masking, hand hygiene dispensers throughout the facility, physical distancing reminders, as well as enhanced cleaning routines. Next, I'd like to provide just a brief update on some of the testing capabilities we have, which is crucial to the diagnosis and management of COVID-19 infections. Locally, we have rapid testing available uh, in Fargo, Detroit Lakes, Ada, Graceville, Foston, and in Wapaton. We're currently using three different testing platforms throughout our essential health service area uh, and are currently capable of doing over 3,000 tests per week. Uh, we have plans to grow that capacity to over 9,000 tests per week uh, over the coming uh, weeks. This would allow us to do all of our testing internally. This, this testing capacity allows us to test patients prior to some of their surgical procedures to ensure the safety of our patients and staff, as well as to be more judicious in our use of our pro uh, protective equipment. We continue to follow the North Dakota Department of Health guidelines for testing. Uh, just some information on our uh, COVID-19 inpatient volumes. Um, over the past two weeks, we've been averaging uh, around nine to 10 patients per day. Uh, this past week, uh, thus far, anyway, uh, we're down to about four to five uh, patients, inpatients uh, per day. Uh, yesterday, we got news from the North Dakota Department of Health uh, around the availability of uh, uh, antiviral uh, medication that you might've heard about uh, from Visitor, 
uh, and they provided some guidance around that, uh, and the supplies are expected to come uh, in the next uh, day or so, uh, and that'll be provided to uh, all the hospitals throughout um, North Dakota, including uh, Essentia here in Fargo and Sanford here in Fargo. Uh, finally, just want to remind people that this is National Hospital Week. I uh, want to again thank our communities for their support of our healthcare workers. Uh, they've shown their support uh, with donations of food, uh, masks, as well as monetary support. In addition, uh, many groups have been holding recognition events. Um, got notification this week that Harley Davidson and the uh, Hog Club will be hosting a ride on Saturday, May 23rd at 1 p.m. They're going to be doing drive-bys uh, of Essentia, Sanford, and the VA here in Fargo. Uh, at 11.50 a.m. today, the Minnesota National Guard 148th Fighter Wing is going to be doing a flyover in what they're calling Operation American Resolve. Uh, and this is on the Minnesota side, but they'll be flying over our Minnesota health care facilities, including uh, Moorhead and Detroit Lakes. I'd like to close by thanking uh, this panel, uh, particularly the government and public health officials for your tire tireless efforts as well as the support of our nurses, doctors, and entire healthcare teams for their dedication and caring for our patients and communities. Uh, and want to wish everyone a happy National uh, Hospital Week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vetter. And I think that flyover is about noon today, isn't it? So we just have to get outside and get some fresh air and watch it go over with our masks on, right? That, that's right. Our next speaker is Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Doug Griffin from Sanford. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give you a brief update. I'm struck by uh, what a difference in a, a year makes. Uh, I think even just a couple of months ago on this day, I anticipated that I would be uh, recovering a little bit of soreness after uh, running the half marathon at the uh, Fargo Marathon that Sanford has probably been sponsored for, but uh, I'll save that soreness for another time. But. Uh, um, let me start also again by uh, thanking again our nurses. We're just a day after what would have been Florence Nightingale's 200th birthday. Her tenaciousness, compassion, and dedication to her profession are embodied in our nurses, not only during this pandemic, but in their caring for patients every day. So let me highlight a few things that I, I know today. Uh, currently, we're caring for 40 patients who have tested positive for COVID-19 in our facility, and we've been around that range uh, all the past week. Uh, we have had 69 of our Sanford and Fargo employees who have tested positive for COVID-19, and they're all at home. Most are actually have recovered and been able to return to work. Uh, on the testing front, last weekend, our drive-through COVID-19 testing team reached a milestone of having collected more than 5,000 uh, tests. And then we're seeing more than 150 appointments a day through there. And then early this week, we passed uh, a greater than 10,000 tests performed overall from Sanford Fargo as well. We've come a long way in this flight. Right? We're employing our expertise and research in several clinical trials for COVID-19 treatments, antibody testing, providing convalescent plasma. And as Dr. Vetter uh, uh, mentioned, we uh, will have access now uh, to remdesivir uh, via the state uh, distribution of that. Stanford, we believe, has cared for over 90% of North Dakota's positive COVID patients in patients. We are proud to have stepped up to meet this need and will continue to be vigilant at finding new ways to treat COVID and share our learning so that all can benefit. As we look for the best ways to develop our own smart restart at Stanford, it's time to look through the windshield instead of the rearview mirror. Everyone must work together to take care of themselves and each other. That means ensuring you're doing all that you can to keep you and your loved ones healthy in the ways that you would at any other time. Getting immunizations, coming in for preventive screenings and physicals, and keeping up with appointments to manage chronic health conditions. We know that delaying care can have detrimental effects on your health. Whether you're the grandfather who ignored his stroke symptoms, the mother with breast cancer, who put off her mammogram, or the sick child who wasn't immunized. We are urging you to please call your doctor. We are here, open, and we want to see you and care for you. 
We do request with, when you come in, and we will remind you of this when you have an appointment, to wear a mask when you come. And while out in public, as previously mentioned, uh, to please mask. I know it's uncomfortable, it seems odd, but it really is one of the best things we can do along with the other social distancing to help uh, prevent the spread and continue to keep the uh, growth of this virus uh, down. Last week, I talked at length about all the steps we're taking to ensure our patients and staff have a safe environment and to receive and provide care. And a few of these steps, again, including the universal face masking for all Sanford uh, caregivers at all times, conducting employee temperature screening at all locations and screening patients as well, limiting personnel and procedure in operating rooms, preoperative COVID testing for surgery patients, diligently disinfecting all patient rooms, procedural areas and waiting areas, plexiglass and social distancing measures in our clinic waiting areas as well. I also want to remind our local business communities that we are here for you and your employees. We know that they're all to trying to decide what is best for them and how to operate in these times. Our occupational medicine clinic is providing consultations, training, guidelines, testing processes, and other resources as businesses begin uh, the smart restart. For those of you in need of care, our promise is to continue to keep our patients and staff safe. I wanna thank all our municipal and public health leaders and those of you on this uh, call today, our physicians and employees as well, and everyone in our community for your support and partnership. We are truly stronger and healthier working together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Griffith and Dr. Vetter. As we heard from Desi, we formed a COVID-19 task force, and that's a grouping that has come together to work on this problem. We have uh, public health, uh, Cass County Public Health, Clay County, Cass County, City of West Fargo and Fargo, working on a task force with the North Dakota Department of Health and also the Department of Health and Human Services as well as North Dakota State University, Dr. Paul Carson, uh, Carson is uh, helping, Carlson is helping us with the ID part of that. In these groups, we divided into three subgroups and the three subgroups are going into education and communication. So in the affected groups, we wanna make sure we're clear in communication and prevent the measures that need to be done. Also in support services, we'd like to help those who must be isolated and have limited resources, have wraparound services that help them survive during this time. And if they're isolated with groceries, with uh, anything that the group might need in order to be home and, and, and not out in the community. Also, we're working with the Clay County subgroup to work with the Minnesota side to make sure the whole metro area is being tested and we're looking into this. So what does that mean to everybody? What we're gonna find is our count's gonna go up. Our count today is 69. It's not gonna be uncommon that you're gonna see counts go up. But the two figures you really wanna watch are the figures of hospital capability, how many hospital admissions they are, and death rate. The death rate from this virus usually is about 6%. We're running about 2.4% at this time. It would not be uncommon to see our death count go up, but are we gonna overwhelm medical facilities? And as you've heard today, both our facilities are ready to take patients. In fact, uh, Rich Vetter said his count was going down, so we're happy to hear that. So again, this comes to be a marathon, and we have to almost model ourselves like New Zealand and Iceland, though they're two countries that have done very well with this disease. And although we may be 8.4%, we may test more and find more cases, but then what you're gonna to try to do is keep it so it doesn't spread from that case count. So what you would do is if you find it, you isolate it, you take care of it. So instead of 8%, you don't want us to jump to 25% of those are positive. So that task force very vigorously is gonna work and you're gonna see testing counts of 1,000 a day, maybe five to 7,000 a week to try to get to where we can contain this disease. And to everybody, the marathon is a great example. I think Dr. Griffin talked about it. This is really a marathon until we get a vaccine. And we need not have the vaccine, so we're gonna be living with this for quite some time. And if all of us accept it, at least till the fall, then we know that that's gonna happen. So the new normal is people, please wear masks when you're out in public areas. Please wash your hands frequently and social distance. If you're not washing your hands enough to use uh, moisturizer lo lotion at night, you're not washing it enough. So as a surgeon, I can tell you, when you wash your hands enough, your skin gets dry. So a quick test to see whether you're washing enough. If your hands aren't chapped by the end of a day, you're not washing enough. 
when I look in the community right now, we do feel that we're not keeping up like we have been. I see a lot of people not wearing masks, not social distancing. We will spread the disease because 10 to 15 percent of the people out there do not have any symptoms and they'll spread it to somebody else if they're not careful. We got good news from the modeling models is that our doubling time has moved from four to 10. So those are good numbers for us and we need to continue to work vigorously on that. So my next speaker is uh, West Fargo Commissioner President Bernie Dardis. Mayor, take it away. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. To all my fellow, fellow panelists, I'd like to give great thanks to you for all that you're doing to protecting our communities and the region. The work that uh, your teams are doing are instrumental in our success, and I give great thanks for you. The City of West Fargo staff has been working from home since March. Having, and we're starting to return to work this week. The return is being slowly ramped up with the utmost caution and strict protocols, which includes wearing masks in hallways and public spaces, monitoring temperatures, frequent disinfecting and hand washing stations, and continuing to keep the buildings closed to the public at this time. We encourage our businesses to look to restart, to adjust their protocols to protect their employees and, com and customers, and to check out ndresponse.gov. Also encourage bi the businesses to check out NDSU's NICE Center at thenicecenter.org for free digital support for local businesses. Businesses can sign up for this free service and a team will help the business launch a digital storefront within 28 to 48 hours. An additional appeal to the business community is please continue to follow the guidelines set forth to protect your employees and your customers. To the public, protect yourselves, protect your loved ones, and protect your neighbors and friends. Desi Fleming said earlier, our director of CAS Public Health, that there's a lot of data coming forward. So many statistics, like drinking from a fire hydrant, and she's right. But there's one thing that we need to remember. The most important part of Desi's message today is that 72% of those testing positive have been identified from close contact and community spread. Ladies and gentlemen, the success of us fighting this pandemic is in our hands, in your hands. So please do all that you possibly can. Finally, I would like to close my remarks with a special message to our local law enforcement community. This week is also National Police Week, and tonight there will be a virtual candlelight vigil for 307 fallen officers. While this week is always a great reminder to thank our police and the sacrifices that they make, it is especially poignant this year that we recognize the safety and service they are providing us in the face of this pandemic. And I'd ask one final thing. As we reflect on National Police Officers Week, a special prayer for the Mosier family here in town who lost a loved one, Officer Moser, in the line of duty. Thank you, stay safe, take care. Thank you, Bernie, for reminding us of that as well. We very much appreciate it. The next speaker is Mayor Mayor Jonathan Judd. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Uh, some updates regarding the uh, city of Moorhead. Uh, the city continues to develop its back to work plan, uh, but it will not have the plan finalized until we hear back from Governor Walls regarding the uh, current Minnesota stay at home order. Uh, that should be getting an update hopefully either later this week or at least by May 18th. Uh, the city is evaluating some programs and operations to determine whether or not uh, those programs that can be implemented in a manner that addresses uh, health concerns. Also on the science front, I'm proud uh, that uh, the Minnesota wastewater operations are working on a COVID-19 research study about the prevalence and the spread of the virus. Moorhead Zone Wastewater Stormwater Operations Manager Andy Bradshaw is the president of the Minnesota Environmental Science and Economic Review Board, also officially known as MESERB, a municipal joint powers organization with more than 50 member cities, sanitary districts, and public utilities commissions that own and operate wastewater treatment facilities in greater Minnesota. 
Misurb is currently assisting and supporting researchers from the, from the University of Minnesota Duluth as they study the prevalence of COVID-19 in wastewater. The study is intended to assist healthcare professionals and government leaders as they develop testing and mitigation strategies in the ongoing fight against this, this disease. And I know uh, Dr. Vetter had mentioned the uh, flyover. And just to clarify, uh, the flyover is going to take place between 11.40 and 11.55 a.m. And I also wanted to send a, a special thank you and a uh, shout out <clears throat> with the recognition uh, for the uh, Minnesota National Guard, along with the 934th Air Wing out of the Air Force Reserve. Uh, also, the Minnesota National Guard's uh, 148th Fighter Wing out of Duluth and the 103rd Air Lift Wing out of Fort Snelling in St. Paul. And the uh, Lift Wing will be flying from west to east over the Sanford Moorhead campus, uh, north of 94 and east of 34th Street to honor the essential workers. So uh, thank you to all the parties that put that together. And also thank you uh, for obviously the essential workers who are on the front lines doing uh, this work. And I'll wrap up with a, a special uh, thank you and shout out to the Moorhead Business Association. Uh, this morning, uh, there was a dialogue discussion with uh, Senator Tina Smith, along with Rep representatives uh, Eileen uh, uh, and uh, Paul Morquart, along with uh, Senator Kent Eakin, engaging in a dialogue regarding uh, federal and state response regarding economic recovery and answering questions and giving us some uh, feedback and some uh, updates on what's going on in Washington regarding these uh, items. Also, a uh, big thank you to uh, Mayor Mahoney and your team over in North Dakota for also including the uh, city of Moorhead along with Clay County and the Red River uh, Task Force. So uh, looking forward to engaging and working as a partner throughout the region uh, to mitigate the uh, spread. And as all key to the panelists, and to those of you on the front lines doing this work. So thank you again, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Judd. Next speaker is Cass County Commissioner Chair Pat Chad Peterson. We got him. When he's in his den, he sometimes doesn't have the audio, so we're just going to wait till Chad comes on. Chad? Let me refresh it. Uh, here we come. We can please see, hear you. There you go. Okay, am I good? Good. All right, rock and roll. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Appreciate the patience. So first, thank you to everyone on the call, public staff, first responders, and healthcare workers. Thank you to those of you back at work, I mean, the business owners, the staff, all doing their best to keep themselves, their coworkers, and customers safe. I want to quickly acknowledge the team of state and local that help us with sign language. I'm trying to speak more slowly so you don't tear a ligament in your hand, I'm also trying to use words that are more commonly used so you don't get mad at me and slash my tires. So yeah, I'm doing my best. Thank you for helping us. The courthouse. The courthouse is still open by appointment only. When you arrive at the courthouse, there will be paper masks available upon entry. We're asking visitors to wear these disposable masks or bring one of your own when visiting all county offices. Again, appointments are still necessary for public access. The election. Cass County government has provided a secure ballot drop box located in front of the county courthouse, if you want to drop things off in person, where ballots can be dropped off 24 hours a day, seven days a week, until 4 p.m. on election day. It'll be locked at that time so no more ballots can be deposited. Ballots must be in the return envelope provided with the ballot, and the return envelope must be signed by the voter. That's what we look at to make sure you are legally voting. The Red River Valley COVID-19 task force. The Cass County team, all of us, appreciate all the efforts from the from the Red River Valley COVID-19 task force to increase testing capacity, decrease the number of positives throughout the community. We'll be continuing to partner with our local government colleagues, everyone on this phone call, 
the state to assess, address, to assess and address challenges during this response. We remain committed to the establishing strategy of locally executed, state managed, and federally supported efforts. With that, stay up to date with any changes moving forward by following at Cass County Gov ND on Twitter and Facebook. And again, as always, thank you to everyone watching and listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay safe, stay smart. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chad. Sorry about the glitch, glad we got you on. And our next speaker is Clay County Commissioner Vice Chair, Jim Haney. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. On a daily basis, Clay County Public Health receives information from the Minnesota Department of Health regarding positive cases. To better understand how the virus is spreading, we want to share some of this information with the public. Minnesota currently has over 12,000 positive cases. Approximately 11.5% of these cases are healthcare workers. Through contact tracing, the Minnesota Department of Health has been able to identify that approximately 12.5% of Clay County positive cases either work or volunteer in a healthcare facility or provide in home health care. These statistics show that our healthcare workers are doing a good job with following guidelines to keep themselves and others safe. As Dr. Griffin and Dr. Vetter mentioned, both Sanford and Essentia are following strict safety guidelines so everyone can use their clinics and hospitals when needed for their medical visits. From the data we received from the Minnesota Department of Health, individuals testing positive for COVID-19 in Clay County reveal the average age is 48 years old, and we have positive cases ranging from young children to seniors. Data also shows our Clay County residents who have tested positive, 43% live in a private residence. We share this data to emphasize that people of all ages and living situations must continue to follow guidance on slowing the spread. Though we know that certain populations are at a higher risk of infection, such as people who are elderly, have underlying health conditions, or who live in long-term care and congregate living settings, Clay County wants to remind the community this virus can infect people of all ages and living settings. For more information on Clay cases in Clay County, please visit the public health section of Clay County's website. As Minnesota nears the end of the governor's stay-at-home order, multiple state departments have been producing resources for businesses and individuals regarding this transition. Following the state and national guidance, Clay County has created initial plans for reopening our buildings to the public. During the initial reopening phase, the public may access services through appointments only. However, most of the buildings will remain locked. We are recommending that the public wear cloth face masks when they come for appointments. New procedures and practices will be Im implemented, including plexiglass barriers at offices, use of specific entrances and exits to the buildings and floor stickers to remind people to stand at least six feet away from others. The date of this initial reopening phase will be announced after the end of the stay at home order. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Thank you very much, Jim, appreciate that. I just wanna reiterate on the uh, COVID-19 task force, there's three committees that are working on reports this week. It's the education and communication. It'll be the support services and Clay County. We anticipate giving those three subcommittees a report probably Monday or Tuesday to tell us what the goals are and where we're headed with this, uh, this event or this uh, joint force. The other thing people will see is you'll see National Guard members in the community. For the testing, we're oftentimes going to be using National Guard to help us get the testing for COVID-19. Uh, we are doing this week alone, over 6,000 tests are doing in the community. So you, you may not see them uh, driving around or going some places, but we will not have events like the Fargo Dome in the future. We'll have more targeted events all through the community. So if you uh, see them around, like Bernie says, say thanks to them for their service and how they're helping us in this community. We also wanna give a shout out to Governor Burgum and Tammy Miller, who's working with us on this task force to get at this disease in our county in a faster fashion and in our valley. So thank you very much for today. Hope everybody stays safe and remember to wear your mask when you're out in public, please. Thank you.